What are the symbolic meanings of the many objects in the Marod altarpiece? The Marod altarpiece is filled with religious symbolism related to the Annunciation. On the table next to Mary are lilies in a vase. The lilies represent Mary's purity and the fact that there are three of them suggest the Holy Trinity. Next to the lilies is a candle. The candle's flame has been recently extinguished and the wick smokes gently, this is a symbol of Christ's incarnation. A small image of infant Christ holding a wooden cross can be seen in the upper left. He flies on a ray of light and has just entered the room through a closed yet unbroken window, which is a reference to Mary's virginity. In the back of the room is a small, brass basin and washcloth. Symbols of Christ who cleanses the sins of the world. In the right panel, Saint Joseph, Mary's husband, is making mousetraps. This might sound strange, but the activity symbolizes St. Joseph's role as protector of Mary and Christ and shows him as a family man. What is Hunter's mural? Hunter's mural is a name given to petroglyphs located in Nine Mile Canyon in Utah. The petroglyphs are an example of rock art, in ancient Greek. Petros means rock and glyph means writing or drawing, attributed to the Fremont culture of the American. Southwest. Hunter's mural depicts a bow hunter aiming his weapon at a flock of bighorn sheep. The Fremont used a unique method to create these Rock 92 images. The canyon walls were naturally stained a dark brown by bacteria. The Fremont scraped this brown varnish away to reveal a lighter shade of rock underneath and form a picture. Petroglyphs similar to Hunter's mural can be found across the American West and Southwest. Some American rock art is thought to date from as early as 7000 BCE. What is the Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde? The Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde in Colorado was built by the Anasazi people, who lived in the Four Corners area of the American Southwest for thousands of years, and are considered ancestors of the Pueblo people. Before the 14th century, the area was less arid and a slightly cooler than it is now and the Anasazi lived by irrigating the land for farming. They built dwellings in natural cliff alcoves, directly underneath the land they farmed. The dwellings, which are among the most dramatic and best preserved examples of Native American architecture, were designed for special purposes such as food storage and religious ritual. Some of the dwellings have as many as 150 rooms and are essentially cave villages. Another structure, Pueblo Benito, was also built by ancestral Pueblo people as early as the 9th century. Is Lisa playing coy?
Leonardo da Vinci used a technique called sfumato, which means smoky in Italian. And he applied sfumato techniques to the corners of the Mona Lisa's eyes and her mouth, creating the famous ambiguity of personality. Because of this, Lisa's mood seems to change upon every viewing. And sometimes it feels like she's in on the joke. Sfumato also helps add to the realism of the portrait, making Mona Lisa appear to live and breathe. When we look at the Mona Lisa, we are as close as we can get to the genius of Leonardo da Vinci. At some point in history, he sat in a room with this woman, mere feet apart, and painted her from life. The painting is a virtuoso work, an example of da Vinci's immense skill, and an enduring masterpiece. Who were the great masters? The term great master can be thrown around quite loosely to indicate a highly esteemed artist. And is used to describe certain Renaissance and 16th century artists. Artists such as Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Titian, among many others. Are referred to both as great masters and occasionally as old masters. To differentiate them from notable artists from more historically recent times. Towards the end of the Renaissance, master artists were increasingly seen as celebrities, rather than mere manual laborers. The term itself comes from the master apprentice system that was used to train artists during the Renaissance. In this system, rather than be sent to an art school, there were none at this time. Students as young as five years old would be sent to work and train as a workshop apprentice under the guidance of a master artist. The master usually promised to feed and house the apprentice in exchange for assistance cleaning and preparing materials, and eventually working on the master's art commissions. Many works by famous artists were the product of a workshop staffed by many artists, including young apprentices. What was Cahokia? Cahokia was the largest pre-Columbian city in what is now the United States, and peaked in size with a population of nearly 25. 000 between the years 800 and 1500 bigger than the city of London at the time. Like the Great Serpent Mound, Cahokia was built by the Mississippian people and featured numerous earthen mounds the result of a huge labor effort. There were around 120 mounds at Cahokia, the largest, known as Monk's Mound. Was 100 feet tall, aligned to the sun. And possibly used as some kind of astronomical observatory in a manner similar to Stonehenge. Evidence of the city can be seen in southern Illinois. What is the Great Serpent Mound? The Great Serpent Mound is a curvilinear burial mound in the shape of a curling snake located in the southern portion of Ohio. 
This monumental earthwork is nearly a quarter of a mile long and is still clearly visible. The Great Serpent Mound was at first attributed to the Adena culture, which flourished in the early woodland period. C300B.C.E-1000 CE, and was known for building monumental mounds used for burial. The site is now thought to be the work of the slightly later Mississippian culture and has been dated to around 1070 CE serpentine forms appear on other types of Mississippian art and serpents, as in many other cultures, were associated with fertility and harvest. Some scholars, however, believe that the shape of the Great Serpent Mound mirrors the path of Halley's Comet, which was visible in the year 1066. The Bayou Tapestry also records this event. Who was Albrecht Dürer? Albrecht Dürer, 1471-1528, was a great master from Germany known for his immaculately detailed drawings, paintings, and prints. He wrote a book of advice for artists called Four Books of Human Proportion and was known to be self-confident and scientifically minded. Like Leonardo da Vinci, Dürer was interested in the observable world. He trained as a goldsmith, this is likely where he gained the skills and experience needed to become a successful printmaker. A form that allowed him to demonstrate his great skill in working with line. Dürer's skill was clear from a young age. At 13, he completed a self-portrait upon which he wrote. Here I portrayed myself in the year 1484 in a mirror when I was still a child, as quoted in Woods. P54. Later self-portraits emphasized the luxurious texture of his long, flowing hair, and one of his most impressive drawings is a hair. 1502, in which Dürer masterfully depicts the sheen of a hare's fur in watercolor. Dyer's woodcuts, engravings, and etchings did a great deal to raise the status of printmaking to a fine art. Two of his most well known prints are The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. 1497 to 1498 and Melancholia I 1514 Who was Hans Holbein Hans Holbein the younger see 1497 to 1543 was a leading German painter who went on to become the court painter to English King Henry VIII. Holbein was a skilled realist with great ability to capture texture and fine detail. His work included religious paintings, prints, and even designs for stained glass windows. But he was particularly well known for his portraits especially his portrait of Henry VIII in 1540. The painting depicts the formidably sized king dressed in his finest clothes against a dark background. The king wears an ornately embroidered coat with yellow, puffed sleeves, fine jewelry, and a feathered hat in celebration of his marriage to Anne of Cleves, his fourth wife. 
the oil paint captures the rich textures of the fabric and Holbein emphasizes the girth and power of the king's frame. The king's decision to invite a German painter, rather than an Italian artist. To his court highlights the strain between England and Italy after the Reformation. What was revolutionary about the Last Supper? Completed between 1495 to 1498 in the refectory of Santa Maria del Grazie in Milan. The Last Supper is considered by some to be Leonardo da Vinci's greatest work, sorry, Mona Lisa. It is a fresco, which means it was painted on a freshly plastered wall. And it depicts the biblical scene in which Jesus Christ breaks bread with his followers on the evening before his death. It was considered revolutionary for a number of reasons, including its naturalism. Da Vinci chose to depict the moment when Christ declares that one of them will betray him. The apostles gathered around the table with Jesus are shocked. Saint John cannot bear it and simply faints at hearing the news. Saint Peter is angered, and pulls out his knife. Foreshadowing his use of the weapon when Jesus is betrayed by Judas in a later part of the biblical narrative. For the first time in art history, Judas is shown on the same side of the table as Christ. Though he leans away, betraying his guilt to the viewer. Like other works of Renaissance art, the story is clearly visually articulated. The apostles are organized into four groups of three, and are all aligned on one side of the table. There are three windows behind the table, and three dark niches along each side. Three being associated with the Holy Trinity. Despite the shock of the news, the painting is calm and the mood is thoughtful. Da Vinci's Last Supper was a major influence on other artists who painted the same scene. Including Tintoretto, Hans Holbein, and Rubens. Were there any professional women artists during the 15th and 16th centuries? Yes. There were many highly regarded women artists working during the Renaissance and the years after in both Italy and Northern Europe. Here are just a few of the approximately 30 known women. Properzia de Rossi, 1490-1530, Bolognese miniature painter. And sculptor trained by Marcantonio Raimondi Lavina Tier Link, c. 1510-1576, miniature painter who worked for the English courts of Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I. Received high acclaim, though none of her works survive Katerina van Hemessen. C.1527 C.1566, painted portraits and religious scenes, worked for the court of Mary, regent of the Netherlands and later the Spanish court Sophonispa Anguissala. 1531-1626 Cremonesa painter who served as a court painter for King Philip II of Spain. Sister Lucia was also a skilled artist Diana Sculturi Gassi, 1547-1612, an engraver also known. 
as Diana Mantovana or Diana Mantuana, first woman to be permitted to print and sell her work under her own name Lavinia Fontana. 1552-1614, mother of eleven children commissioned to paint the martyrdom of St. Who was Sophonis Ba Anguissala? It is true that most professional artists in Europe at this time were men. It was not easy for women to be accepted by patrons and male-dominated guilds. There were women artists, however, and the women who painted professionally were usually part of artist families. Such as Katerina van Hemessen and the Baroque painter Artemisia Gentileschi, the Cremonese painter. Sophonis by Anguissala, c. 1532-1625, was different. She was the oldest of seven children in a noble family. Whose father was a classical enthusiast interested in giving a humanist education to all of his children. He recognized Sophonis Ba's natural talent and sent her to train under a respected local painter. Bernardino Campi. She gained esteem for her portraits, including a number of engaging self portraits, as well as paintings of the Virgin Mary. She was asked by King Philip II of Spain to serve as a lady-in-waiting to his third wife. Isabel de Valois, an extremely high honor written about by Giorgio Vasari. There. She painted portraits of the Queen and experimented with mirrors in her self-portraits. In 1552 she painted a miniature portrait, a popular way of depicting friends and loved ones in which she depicted herself holding a large medallion. Her name encircles the edge of the medallion while an interlaced monogram made up of her sister's names is in the center. The miniature is now at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Why is the Leaning Tower of Pisa well, leaning? The Leaning Tower of Pisa, or Campanile, Italian for Bell Tower, is part of a larger cathedral complex uniformly designed in white marble. The tower, built between 1171 and 1271, started to lean even before construction. Was completed because of the soft ground upon which it was built. And because the base was too small for the nearly 180 foot height of the tower. The builders tried to adapt to the lean during construction and a slight bend is noticeable in the upper floors. This did not work. In the last few decades, structural engineers have excavated underneath the tower in order to stabilize it. What is the High Renaissance? The High Renaissance is a name given to the late 15th and early 16th centuries during which time great masters such as Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael were active. Along with slightly later northern Italian artists such as Titian, Correggio, and Giorgian. The High Renaissance is widely considered one of the greatest periods in the history of art. 
and is certainly the most famous period of Italian art. The High Renaissance is not only an Italian phenomenon great masters from Northern Europe include Albrecht Dürer and Hans Holbein, among others. Besides art, great scientific discoveries were also made during the High Renaissance. Including the revolutionary work of Galileo and Johannes Kepler. The High Renaissance was a unique and important period of intellectual, technological, and artistic achievement in European history. What is the Villa Rotunda? The Villa Rotunda was a residence designed by the architect Palladio in the 1560s. Palladio, who wrote four books on architecture, was greatly inspired by the Roman temple form. He was interested in architectural theory, ideal proportions, and the classical orders. Similar in form to the Pantheon in Rome, the Villa Rotunda is completely symmetrical. With a projecting portico on each square side and is topped with a hemispherical dome. Palladio's work went on to inspire architects for centuries, especially in Britain and the United States. What is the Vitruvian Man? The Vitruvian Man is a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci of a visual concept. Described by the Roman architect Vitruvius in the 1st century B. CE in his work on architecture. As an architect, Vitruvius was interested in harmony, symmetry, and balance all qualities that were highly valued by classically minded artists and architects during the Renaissance, including Leonardo da Vinci. He explained his belief that supremely beautiful and unified architecture could be created using the proportions of the human body as a guide. As Vitruvius never provided any illustrations of his own. Many different artists attempted to visually depict the concept. Da Vinci's drawing is likely the most familiar version. An idealized human male is depicted standing tall within a circle and a square. The figure's outstretched arms are shown in duplicate, one set reaches the point at which the circle meets the square. While the second set runs horizontally, reaching the vertical sides of the square. The figure also has two pairs of legs, one straight, and one outstretched. Mirroring the position of the arms. The drawing highlights Leonardo da Vinci's mathematical. Creativity and emphasizes the Renaissance preference for geometric balance. Who was Bronzino? Bronzino was the nickname of Florentine artist Agnolo di Cosimo. 1503 to 1572, who studied under Pontormo, a fellow Mannerist painter. Bronzino's most significant patron was the Medici family, for whom he completed many projects, including altar pieces and frescoes. Today, his portraits are among his most well known paintings, 
particularly his portrait of a young man. Painted in the 1530s, and now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. The identity of the young portrait sitter is unknown. But he is likely a friend of Bronzino's who ran in the same literary circles, Bronzino also wrote poetry. The sitter holds his finger gingerly between the pages of a book, eliciting curiosity about its contents. The well-dressed young man is poised. With good posture and an air of confidence that is only belied by his slightly crossed eyes. He seems to be fully aware of his own superficial airs. He is as much of a mask as the faces carved into the side of the ornate table. This is Bronzino's skill the artist has an ability to purposefully pose his sitter for the viewer. To make us aware that we can only see the cover, and not the contents of the book. What are the main characteristics of Romanesque architecture? Romanesque architecture is notable for its use of round arches, military strength, and exterior architectural sculpture, the latter having fallen out of favor in Europe during earlier centuries. Romanesque buildings rely on thick walls, barrel vaults, and strong piers for structural support, allowing room for relatively small windows. As Europe was a culturally and politically fragmented landscape during the medieval period, Romanesque architectural styles vary greatly depending on the geographic region. For example, at first glance the church of St. Cernan in Toulouse, France might not look much like the Pisa Cathedral in Italy but these 11th century examples are both considered Romanesque due to their use of round arches. Thick walls, cruciform structure and exterior sculptural detail. Why are art historians so confused about the Arnolfini portrait? The Arnolfini portrait, completed in 1434 by Jan van Eyck, is both enchanting and enigmatic. A great deal of questions surround the work. The painting depicts a well-dressed couple surrounded by evidence of wealth. Possibly a merchant named Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife, Giovanna Senemi, though new research indicates that these two individuals did not actually marry until over a decade after the portrait was painted adding to the mystery. Perhaps the couple is instead from a different part of the extended Arnolfini family. Like the Marode altarpiece, the painting includes many symbolic objects, some religious and some secular. For example, the dog in the foreground is a symbol of love and loyalty. While the crystal prayer beads in the back of room symbolize the couple's piety. Debate rages on as to whether or not the woman in the portrait is pregnant. As her hand rests on the top of her stomach. But, perhaps the couple only desires a baby? One of the most curious parts of the painting is the mirror on the back wall. Just above this mirror is a note that reads, Jan van Eyck was here. 
within the mirror appear the backs of the couple along with the face of an additional figure. Is it Van Eyck himself? Art historians aren't sure. Regardless of the mysteries surrounding this painting, it is a masterfully detailed work and serves as a window into another world. What is the Isenheim altarpiece? The Eisenheim altarpiece, c. 1510-1515, is a highly realistic altarpiece painting done by the German painter Matthias Grunewald, who was a painter at the court of the Archbishop of Mainz. The work is complex, incorporating exterior paintings on the wings of the altarpiece with interior paintings that are revealed upon opening. The exterior subject is the crucifixion of Christ. Painted in gruesome detail and emphasizing Christ's suffering against a dark background. His fingers are bent and broken and his emaciated body hangs heavily from the cross. The interior paintings are completed on multiple panels and include the Annunciation. The Virgin and Child with Angels, and the Resurrection. These interior works are brightly colored and emphasize hope and joy over suffering. The physical act of opening the door is symbolic of the salvation that comes from Christ's sacrifice. The Eisenheim altarpiece is emotionally expressive and a powerful example of the role of art in the Christian tradition. When did printmaking begin? By the 16th century, printing technology, such as the woodcut, had been around for hundreds of years, first developing in China in the 5th century. Printmaking was first used to apply patterns to textiles, and then later was used on paper. Intaglio processes, such as engraving and etching, developed in Germany in the middle of the 15th century. Evolved from techniques used by goldsmiths and jewelers. Printmaking allowed artists to make multiple copies of a text or an image. And mass production of prints began in the 16th century, forever changing the consumption of art images and texts. What is Romanesque art? Although the term itself was not used until the 19th century. Romanesque means Roman-like and is used to describe 11th through 12th. Century medieval art and architecture featuring Roman characteristics. The Romanesque period saw a revival in monumental architecture, sculpture, and wall painting. How did Jan van Eyck achieve such incredible detail in his work? The work of Jan van Eyck is known for its incredible detail and realism. Like other artists of Northern Europe, van Eyck used oil paints. Oil paints take a long time to dry allowing artists time to work slowly and blend colors. 
northern artists like Van Eyck built up layers of oil paint by applying many thin glazes. Compared to the egg-based tempera paints used in Italy, oil paints can achieve much richer hues. Paint brushes made for painting detail were important some. Brushes were so thin that they were made of a single hair. Jan van Eyck is thought to be one of the first Renaissance artists to extensively use optic technology. Such as convex mirrors and lenses, to help achieve a high level of detail in his work. Who was Guyam Bologna? Guyam Bologna, 1529-1608 was an extremely successful late Mannerist sculptor who was known by many names, including Jean de Bologna and Giovanni de Bologna. Though he was born in Flanders in northern Europe, he worked in Florence, where he received support from the Medici family and other Flemish patrons living in the Italian city. Much of his work was done in marble and bronze, his work often features energetic figures. Engaged in dramatic physical activity, as well as graceful, elongated female figures. He was a master at creating complex poses with multiple figures. Including the rape of the Sabina and the fountain of Neptune. His most famous sculpture is probably Mercury, c. 1565, which represents the Roman messenger god, Hermes, in Greek. Balancing delicately on a small puff of wind, blown by the god, Zephyr. Winged Mercury reaches one hand to the sky with a long finger pointing vertically. With one leg bent back, almost like a dancer. The sculpture was a gift from Cosimo de' Medici to Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian II. What makes the Mona Lisa such a great work of art? Her face is everywhere, from backpacks to refrigerator magnets. She occasionally sports a mustache and glasses, and her head has even been replaced by Bart Simpson's. But make no mistake, thousands of people a year crowd around the real thing hanging in the Louvre in Paris. What is El Escorial? El Escorial is an enormous monastery palace built by Spanish King Philip II in Madrid between 1563 and 1584 Philip II took over control of Spain after his father, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, abdicated. Philip was therefore one of the most powerful rulers in Europe. Controlling territories in Spain, the Netherlands, Milan, Burgundy, Naples, and even the Americas. Philip II was a devout Catholic and El Escorial combined a seminary, convent, and basilica with the royal palace. The main architect was Juan Bautista de Toledo until his death. When Juan de Herrera took over, eventually completing the project. The building design is reminiscent of Italian classicism. 
but it is formidable and severe, reflecting the power of the Spanish crown. What is El Escorial? El Escorial is an enormous monastery palace built by Spanish King Philip II in Madrid between 1563 and 1584 Philip II took over control of Spain after his father, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, abdicated. Philip was therefore one of the most powerful rulers in Europe. Controlling territories in Spain, the Netherlands, Milan, Burgundy, Naples, and even the Americas. Philip II was a devout Catholic and El Escorial combined a seminary, convent, and basilica with the royal palace. The main architect was Juan Bautista de Toledo until his death. When Juan de Herrera took over, eventually completing the project. The building design is reminiscent of Italian classicism. But it is formidable and severe, reflecting the power of the Spanish crown. How can El Greco's paintings appear so modern? To some, the paintings of El Greco appear more closely related to 19th century Impressionism or 20th century Expressionism than the 16th century Spanish styles of nearly 500 years earlier. His work is characterized by loose brush strokes, often ghostly, elongated figures, and a use of colors in line with the Mannerists. El Greco's real name was Domnikos Theodokopoulos and El Greco means the Greek in Spanish. Born in Crete in 1541, he worked in Italy before arriving in Toledo, Spain. With the unfulfilled goal of becoming an artist in the court of Philip II. Although the king didn't favor El Greco, he did find many other patrons. His 1586 painting The Burial of Count Orgaz, depicts the soul of the dead count as it rises to heaven. Accompanied by an angel, and surrounded by an audience of saints. Holy figures, and well-known individuals from Toledo. The figures are pale, ghostly, and white which contrasts with the bright yellows worn by the clergy and the red fabrics worn by the Virgin Mary in heaven. The painting is arguably similar in style to Italian Mannerists such as Pontormo. And El Greco is considered by some to be a Mannerist painter. How can El Greco's paintings appear so modern? To some, the paintings of El Greco appear more closely related to 19th century Impressionism or 20th century Expressionism than the 16th century Spanish styles of nearly 500 years earlier. His work is characterized by loose brush strokes, often ghostly, elongated figures, and a use of colors in line with the Mannerists. El Greco's real name was Domnikos Theodokopoulos and El Greco means the Greek in Spanish. Born in Crete in 1541, 
he worked in Italy before arriving in Toledo, Spain. With the unfulfilled goal of becoming an artist in the court of Philip II. Although the king didn't favor El Greco, he did find many other patrons. His 1586 painting The Burial of Count Orgaz, depicts the soul of the dead count as it rises to heaven. Accompanied by an angel, and surrounded by an audience of saints. Holy figures, and well-known individuals from Toledo. The figures are pale, ghostly, and white. Which contrasts with the bright yellows worn by the clergy and the red fabrics worn by the Virgin Mary in heaven. The painting is arguably similar in style to Italian mannerists such as Pontormo. And El Greco is considered by some to be a mannerist painter. What was the Ottoman Empire? The Ottoman Empire was a Turkish state founded in the 13th century by Osman I. Who then expanded his territories, eventually dislodging Byzantine rulers and taking over Constantinople in 1453. Constantinople now called Istanbul, became the capital of the Ottoman Empire, which by the 15th century controlled large portions of North Africa, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean. The Ottoman Empire was one of the longest lasting powers in history. Only falling in 1922 when Turkey became a republic. What was the Ottoman Empire? The Ottoman Empire was a Turkish state founded in the 13th century by Osman I. Who then expanded his territories, eventually dislodging Byzantine rulers and taking over Constantinople in 1453. Constantinople now called Istanbul, became the capital of the Ottoman Empire, which by the 15th century controlled large portions of North Africa, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean. The Ottoman Empire was one of the longest lasting powers in history. Only falling in 1922 when Turkey became a republic. How was the Hagia Sophia converted to a mosque? When the Ottoman Turks took control over the former Byzantine Empire, the Hagia Sophia, which had been built as a cathedral by Emperor Justinian in the 6th century, was converted into a mosque. The conversion of the Hagia Sophia was an important symbol of power for the conquering ruler, Sultan Mehmet II. Many of the Byzantine mosaics were covered in plaster and certain elements, such as the altar, were removed. Elements of Islamic architecture were incorporated into the building, such as the mirab. A niche that indicates the direction of Mecca for prayer, as well as the large minarets outside. In the 20th century, the Hagia Sophia became a public museum. And many of the Byzantine mosaics were restored.
How was the Hagia Sophia converted to a mosque? When the Ottoman Turks took control over the former Byzantine Empire, the Hagia Sophia, which had been built as a cathedral by Emperor Justinian in the 6th century, was converted into a mosque. The conversion of the Hagia Sophia was an important symbol of power for the conquering ruler, Sultan Mehmet II. Many of the Byzantine mosaics were covered in plaster and certain elements, such as the altar, were removed. Elements of Islamic architecture were incorporated into the building, such as the mirab, a niche that indicates the direction of Mecca for prayer, as well as the large minarets outside. In the 20th century, the Hagia Sophia became a public museum. And many of the Byzantine mosaics were restored. Who was Suleiman the Magnificent? Suleiman I, known as Suleiman the Magnificent, 1494-1566, ruled the Ottoman Empire from 1520 until his death. He was trained as a goldsmith and was a great patron of the arts. Under his rule, ceramics, calligraphy, manuscript illumination. Metal working, textiles, and architecture flourished. Suleiman supported a royal painting society, the Nakashkain, whose styles greatly influenced other artists throughout the Ottoman Empire. A good example of the Nakashkain style is in their design. For the Sultan's imperial signature, known as a tughra. It features bold, sweeping lines and ornate organic decoration done in ink and watercolor on paper. It incorporates both abstract design and calligraphy. And includes the name of the Sultan as well as the phrase the eternally victorious. Who was Suleiman the Magnificent? Suleiman I, known as Suleiman the Magnificent, 1494 to 1566, ruled the Ottoman Empire from 1520 until his death. He was trained as a goldsmith and was a great patron of the arts. Under his rule, ceramics, calligraphy, manuscript illumination, metal working, textiles, and architecture flourished. Suleiman supported a royal painting society, the Nakashkane. Whose styles greatly influenced other artists throughout the Ottoman Empire. A good example of the Nakashkane style is in their design. For the Sultan's imperial signature, known as a tughra, it features bold, sweeping lines and ornate organic decoration done in ink and watercolor on paper. It incorporates both abstract design and calligraphy. And includes the name of the Sultan as well as the phrase the eternally victorious. Who was seen in the Great?
Sinan the Great, c. 1489-1588, whose full name was Koka Mimar Sinan Aga. Was arguably the most famous architect in Islamic history, designing over 300 buildings. Including the Mosque of Salim II, which is considered his masterpiece. Also known as the Salimiyye Mosque. The Mosque of Salim II was built between 1569 and 1575 in Edirne, Turkey. Sinan designed it when he was almost 80 years old. And his goal was to surpass the great architecture of the previous Byzantine Empire. He created a larger dome than that of the Hagia Sophia from base to crown. The building's interior is a masterwork of mathematical proportion and geometry. Fusing an octagon with a dome covered square, with four half domes in each corner. Who was seen in the Great? Sinan the Great, c. 1489-1588, whose full name was Koka Mimar Sinan Aga. Was arguably the most famous architect in Islamic history, designing over 300 buildings. Including the Mosque of Salim II, which is considered his masterpiece. Also known as the Salimiyye Mosque. The Mosque of Salim II was built between 1569 and 1575 in Edirne, Turkey. Sinan designed it when he was almost 80 years old. And his goal was to surpass the great architecture of the previous Byzantine Empire. He created a larger dome than that of the Hagia Sophia from base to crown. The building's interior is a masterwork of mathematical proportion and geometry. Fusing an octagon with a dome covered square, with four half domes in each corner. What is Islamic tile work? Islamic art has a long tradition of decorative tile work, which was used to decorate the walls and other surfaces. Both interior and exterior, of important buildings such as mosques and palaces. The 16th and 17th centuries were considered to be a golden age of Islamic tile work. Tile mosaics, in which glass or ceramic are organized into decorative patterns and then plastered, was one very popular technique. Another was known as dry cord tile work, also known as cure da seca. First popularized in Spain during Umayyad rule. This process relies on large pieces of multicolored tiles. Rather than smaller, individually colored fragments. Buildings such as the Imam Mosque to Isfahan, Iran. Are covered in intricately patterned tiles in astonishing geometric and abstract forms. What is Islamic tile work? Islamic art has a long tradition of decorative tile work, which was used to decorate the walls and other surfaces. 
both interior and exterior, of important buildings such as mosques and palaces. The 16th and 17th centuries were considered to be a golden age of Islamic tile work. Tile mosaics, in which glass or ceramic are organized into decorative patterns and then plastered, was one very popular technique. Another was known as dry cord tile work, also known as cure da seca. First popularized in Spain during Umayyad rule. This process relies on large pieces of multicolored tiles. Rather than smaller, individually colored fragments. Buildings such as the Imam Mosque to Isfahan, Iran. Are covered in intricately patterned tiles in astonishing geometric and abstract forms. What is a miniature painting? Particularly popular in Persian, Ottoman, and Mughal traditions, miniature paintings are small works on paper. Whether book illustrations or separate paintings kept in albums, known as a muraksa. Miniature paintings were not framed and not displayed on walls, but were meant to be held in one's hands. Miniature painting required years of training and apprenticeship to create. One of the most important centers of miniature painting was the Royal Herat School in Afghanistan, where students were instructed on painting and calligraphy. During the early 16th century, the school was moved to Tabriz, Iran. Miniature painters sat on the ground with one knee bent to support the painting board. Multiple layers of colors derived from pigments were applied, including gold, and then the painting was burnished. What is a miniature painting? Particularly popular in Persian, Ottoman, and Mughal traditions, miniature paintings are small works on paper. Whether book illustrations or separate paintings kept in albums, known as a muraksa. Miniature paintings were not framed and not displayed on walls, but were meant to be held in one's hands. Miniature painting required years of training and apprenticeship to create. One of the most important centers of miniature painting was the Royal Herat School in Afghanistan, where students were instructed on painting and calligraphy. During the early 16th century, the school was moved to Tabriz, Iran. Miniature painters sat on the ground with one knee bent to support the painting board. Multiple layers of colors derived from pigments were applied, including gold, and then the painting was burnished. Who was Bilzid? Kamal al-Din Bihzid, referred to simply as Bihzid, was one of the most famous Persian manuscript painters during the 15th century. He was born around 1450 in the city of Herat, in modern-day Afghanistan. He worked for royal courts under both Timurid and Seyfavid rule. The Timurid rulers descended from Genghis Khan, 
and were succeeded by the Safavids as rulers of Iran. Bihazid's paintings are characterized by vivid color, dynamic detail, and warping perspective. His work notably includes representations of figures. Something more common in Persian and Indian painting than other Islamic art. One of Bihazid's most famous miniature paintings is Seduction of Yusuf, c. 1488, a story included in both the Bible and the Quran. In the story, Yusuf, Joseph, is seduced by Zalaikha, the wife of Potiphar. According to the Persian version of the tale, Zalaikha led Yusuf through seven rooms of her palace, locking the door of each room behind her. In the final room, she propositioned Yusuf. But he was able to escape when the doors were miraculously unlocked. In the painting, zigzagging beige panels contain the actual Arabic text of the story at the top, bottom, and in the middle of the manuscript page. Zalaikha's palace is made up of intricately decorated. Multicolored panels connected by angled, polygonal staircases. This geometric, two-dimensional painting gives the illusion of three-dimensional space and is a masterpiece of Persian manuscript painting. Who was Bilzid? Kamal al-Din Bihazid, referred to simply as Bihazid, was one of the most famous Persian manuscript painters during the 15th century. He was born around 1450 in the city of Herat, in modern-day Afghanistan. He worked for royal courts under both Timurid and Safavid rule. The Timurid rulers descended from Genghis Khan, and were succeeded by the Safavids as rulers of Iran. Bihazid's paintings are characterized by vivid color, dynamic detail, and warping perspective. His work notably includes representations of figures. Something more common in Persian and Indian painting than other Islamic art. One of Bihazid's most famous miniature paintings is Seduction of Yusuf, c. 1488, a story included in both the Bible and the Quran. In the story, Yusuf, Joseph, is seduced by Zalaikha, the wife of Potiphar. According to the Persian version of the tale, Zalaikha led Yusuf through seven rooms of her palace, locking the door of each room behind her. In the final room, she propositioned Yusuf, but he was able to escape when the doors were miraculously unlocked. In the painting, zigzagging beige panels contain the actual Arabic text of the story at the top bottom, and in the middle of the manuscript page. Zalaikha's palace is made up of intricately decorated, multicolored panels connected by angled, polygonal staircases. This geometric, two-dimensional painting gives the illusion of three-dimensional space and is a masterpiece of Persian manuscript painting. What is the art of Benin?
Benin, also known as the Edo Empire, was an important African state that lasted from 1440 to 1897. The Heart of the Empire Benin City, was located about 150 miles away from Isle Ife in Nigeria. Similar to Isle Ife, Benin had a long tradition of memorial. Sculpture and shrines were built in honor of deceased obas, or kings. Popular materials for sculpture included ivory and bronze, and it is partly because of the use of these. Durable materials that more art from Benin has survived than from other African cultures from this time period. The power of the Edo Empire peaked in the 16th century and succumbed to the British Empire towards the end of the 19th century. Many of Benin's art treasures are now part of the British Museum and other Western institutions. What is the art of Benin? Benin, also known as the Edo Empire, was an important African state that lasted from 1440 to 1897. The Heart of the Empire Benin City, was located about 150 miles away from Isle Ife in Nigeria. Similar to Isle Ife, Benin had a long tradition of memorial. Sculpture and shrines were built in honor of deceased obas, or kings. Popular materials for sculpture included ivory and bronze, and it is partly because of the use of these. Durable materials that more art from Benin has survived than from other African cultures from this time period. The power of the Edo Empire peaked in the 16th century and succumbed to the British Empire towards the end of the 19th century. Many of Benin's art treasures are now part of the British Museum and other Western institutions. What is the Queen Mother Pendant Mask? The Queen Mother Pendant Mask likely represents Idia, the mother of Oba Isaji, who ruled Benin between 1504 and 1550. Nearly 10 inches tall, it is made of carved ivory and was meant to be worn at the hip. The face of Idia is skillfully carved in a highly naturalistic style, with powerful eyes and stylized hair. Along the top and bottom of the mask are carved images of Portuguese soldiers with whom Benin had an amicable trade relationship. The solider images alternate with images of the mudfish, which was symbolic of wealth, creativity, and the sea. A second, nearly identical, pendant mask was also carved from the same piece of ivory. One is in the British Museum while the other is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. What is the Queen Mother Pendant Mask? The Queen Mother Pendant Mask likely represents Idia, the mother of Oba Isaji, who ruled Benin between 1504 and 1550. Nearly 10 inches tall, it is made of carved ivory and was meant to be worn at the hip. The face of Idia is skillfully carved in a highly naturalistic style, with powerful eyes and stylized hair. 
Along the top and bottom of the mask are carved images of Portuguese soldiers. With whom Benin had an amicable trade relationship. The solider images alternate with images of the mudfish. Which was symbolic of wealth, creativity, and the sea. A second, nearly identical, pendant mask was also carved from the same piece of ivory. One is in the British Museum while the other is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. What are the sappy salt cellars? Sappy salt cellars, made of ivory, were a result of Portuguese trade relationships with artists along the coast of West Africa. The Portuguese commissioned luxury goods such as spoons, forks, decorative boxes, and salt cellars. At the time, salt was itself a luxury good that only the rich could afford. And an exotic, carved salt cellar was a symbol of wealth. Art historians have identified what they think are three. Individual sappy carvers who produced much of the work. The styles of the salt cellars are a blend of African and Portuguese influence. Mixing Christian imagery and European hunting scenes with royal iconography familiar within the Benin art historical tradition. In a way, the sappy salt cellars are the first example of tourist art in Africa. As these were objects created with the intention of exporting them. What are the sappy salt cellars? Sappy salt cellars, made of ivory, were a result of Portuguese trade relationships with artists along the coast of West Africa. The Portuguese commissioned luxury goods such as spoons, forks, decorative boxes, and salt cellars. At the time, salt was itself a luxury good that only the rich could afford. And an exotic, carved salt cellar was a symbol of wealth. Art historians have identified what they think are three. Individual sappy carvers who produced much of the work. The styles of the salt cellars are a blend of African and Portuguese influence. Mixing Christian imagery and European hunting scenes with royal iconography familiar within the Benin art historical tradition. In a way, the sappy salt cellars are the first example of tourist art in Africa. As these were objects created with the intention of exporting them. What is the creation of Adam? The creation of Adam is the most famous of Michelangelo's frescoes on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Adam is seen nude, reclining on a patch of bare terrain while God the Father approaches from the air. Accompanied by angels and cherubs. God is shown with long, gray hair and a flowing beard, which are blown back by the wind. A red cape swirls around the figures and God's hand reaches out. Toward Adam with one finger outstretched, delivering the spark of life. 
Adam seems to move slightly towards God. Though his wrist is limp and his head lolls to one side he is not yet fully alive. Their fingers appear mere centimeters apart, eliciting tension and drama. This is one of the most iconic images in all of art history. Michelangelo has captured the seconds immediately before God awakens Adam to life. The creation of Adam is both delicate and powerful, poised and energized. What is a miniature painting? Particularly popular in Persian, Ottoman, and Mughal traditions, miniature paintings are small works on paper. Whether book illustrations or separate paintings kept in albums, known as a muraksa. Miniature paintings were not framed and not displayed on walls, but were meant to be held in one's hands. Miniature painting required years of training and apprenticeship to create. One of the most important centers of miniature painting was the Royal Herat School in Afghanistan. Where students were instructed on painting and calligraphy. During the early 16th century, the school was moved to Tabriz, Iran. Miniature painters sat on the ground with one knee bent to support the painting board. Multiple layers of colors derived from pigments were applied, including gold, and then the painting was burnished. How was the Hagia Sophia converted to a mosque? When the Ottoman Turks took control over the former Byzantine Empire, the Hagia Sophia, which had been built as a cathedral by Emperor Justinian in the 6th century, was converted into a mosque. The conversion of the Hagia Sophia was an important symbol of power for the conquering ruler, Sultan Mehmed II. Many of the Byzantine mosaics were covered in plaster and certain elements, such as the altar, were removed. Elements of Islamic architecture were incorporated into the building, such as the mirab. A niche that indicates the direction of Mecca for prayer, as well as the large minarets outside. In the 20th century, the Hagia Sophia became a public museum. And many of the Byzantine mosaics were restored. What is the Sistine Chapel? In a letter to a friend in 1508, Michelangelo admitted that he disliked painting and really didn't want to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, now one of the most famous ceilings in the world. It is located in the Vatican, the official residence of the Pope in Rome. The Sistine Chapel, named after Pope Sixtus IV was designed to be the same size as the Temple of Solomon and was built between 1475 and 1481. The interior of the chapel is covered in frescoes depicting Christian subjects and themes. Pope Julius II personally asked for Michelangelo to paint the ceiling frescoes. And after he reluctantly accepted, 
Rumor also has it that the artist shut himself up in the chapel for four years, refusing to let anyone else in. That part of the story is very unlikely, Michelangelo would have needed the support of his workshop apprentices to complete the project in four years. Michelangelo did not paint the walls of the Sistine Chapel. That work was completed by other artists such as Sandro Botticelli and Domenico Gerlandeo, Michelangelo's former master. The wall frescoes visually narrate scenes from the Bible, including the story of Moses and the life of Christ. On the ceiling, Michelangelo depicted numerous Old Testament scenes including David and Goliath, the creation of Adam, the fall from Paradise, and Judith and Holofernes. With hundreds of figures in multiple poses, various different scenes, plants, nature, and illusionistic architectural elements, it's a wonder the Sistine Chapel isn't a sensory overload. But Michelangelo was able to infuse the entire 45x128 foot space with a sense of grace, calm, and awe. What is the Queen Mother Pendant Mask? The Queen Mother Pendant Mask likely represents Idia, the mother of Oba Isaji, who ruled Benin between 1504 and 1550. Nearly 10 inches tall, it is made of carved ivory and was meant to be worn at the hip. The face of Idia is skillfully carved in a highly naturalistic style, with powerful eyes and stylized hair. Along the top and bottom of the mask are carved images of Portuguese soldiers, with whom Benin had an amicable trade relationship. The solider images alternate with images of the mudfish, which was symbolic of wealth, creativity, and the sea. A second, nearly identical, pendant mask was also carved from the same piece of ivory. One is in the British Museum while the other is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. <laughs>